Now, it's true, the title of this talk is, does the Trump administration have a policy, does it have a strategy for the Middle East? How many people here think that the Trump administration has a policy for the Middle East? <laughs> Two people, okay. How many people, three people, how many people think it does not have a policy for the Middle East? How many people are not sure? Okay, so I want to prove to you that I actually am a diplomat. I agree with all of you. <laughs> I was going to pose the question, do you think I think they have it? But, but the way you responded suggested that very few people think here that it, there actually is a policy or a strategy. Most are unsure. Some think there isn't. I actually think that there is a policy, but not a strategy. A strategy would integrate all the different elements that they're pursuing. A strategy would identify a very clear set of objectives and a set of means to achieve them. And here, there's a fairly significant gap between the stated objectives and the actual means that are used. But rather than treat this as an abstraction, what I want to do is I actually want to go through what are the key elements of the policy that I see, uh, where are they wanting, what could be done to give them more of a chance to succeed, uh, and then so at least at the end of today, when you walk out of here, I won't have to pass out antidepressants. I want to at least give you a sense that there could be some possibility. I'm not going to exaggerate that, but there could be some possibility. All right. So what? What are the key elements? Uh, one, and I would say elements slash objectives. One, there is a counter-ISIS, counter-terrorism approach, for sure. Two, there is a counter-Iranian approach, for sure. And three, there is a desire to do the, quote, ultimate deal which is the way President Trump refers to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So in all three of these areas, there is, in fact, an approach. Now let's take a closer look at each one. The counter-ISIS approach. There is no question that there is a serious effort to defeat ISIS. As President Trump says, I'm quoting him now, we're kicking the hell out of ISIS. Now, that is a, the military side of the approach. Uh, and to be fair, ISIS has been reduced in terms of the territory it now has. We don't have a map of the Middle East here, but if you imagine, if you imagine Syria, ISIS is now physically only in the southeast corner of the country. It's still there. The numbers are reduced. Uh, the territory it actually occupies is relatively small, but they're not defeated yet. And of course, they also have affiliates basically throughout the Middle East in smaller numbers. They actually have a significant affiliate in the Sinai. They still have significant presence, even though it's been narrowed, in Libya. But the approach of the administration is essentially a military approach. Now, that is significant because any movement like ISIS depends upon the image of success. That's at least one significant element of its attraction. Uh, it claimed to have defined, you know, being defined messengers or, or being messengers of God, uh, and that gave it its power. That's how it could see, succeed over all odds. So the more you defeat it militarily, the more you begin to erode at least part of its appeal. But a major part of its appeal is also its ability to sort of reflect frustration, a sense of injustice, a sense of oppression of Sunnis. And for that to be defeated, because again, understand ISIS is not just a movement, it's an ideology. You cannot defeat an ideology only through the use of military force. The use of force is an essential element, but it's not sufficient. So the Trump administration has an approach on the military side, to be honest, that is a continuation of what President Obama was doing. To be fair, the military is less constrained than it was under President Obama. Uh, the set of targets, uh, the readiness to, we have more special operators on the ground helping with targeting, we have more people embedded in units. 
But it's basically our using force, but mostly from the air, and relying upon local forces on the ground, principally the Kurds, uh, to be, in effect, our foot soldiers. And that's a continuation of Obama, but fewer constraints on the military, slightly larger presence uh, in Syria than was the case under Obama. The problem with the approach is that it doesn't deal with the ideological side of the ISIS threat, and it also doesn't deal with, well, what happens after you defeat them on the ground? I mean, ISIS emerged from what was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. When Al-Qaeda in Iraq was defeated, the problem is Maliki in Iraq and then Assad in Syria completely oppressed Sunnis, so they began to look for someone who would come in to save them. That was ISIS originally. ISIS presented itself as basically countering what was the oppression of Sunnis, standing up for them. So now when we go ahead and we defeat ISIS and liberate certain areas, you can't just leave a vacuum. What's needed? You'll see, by the way, I'm really good at asking questions. And all of my questions I can answer. Okay, I will see how I do with your questions, but my questions I can answer. So what is needed? Well, at least two different kinds of, two different things are really needed. Number one, the first thing that is needed is when you clear out an area of ISIS, you've got to have a plan for reconstruction, for security, for governance, and for inclusion. You have to create governance that includes everyone, isn't exclusionary. Now, does the administration have a plan for that? Well, since the administration is absolutely determined not to spend any money there, I would say that its plan is limited because without money, there's no reconstruction. But again, so how does the administration approach that? Well, someone else should pay for it. At one point, the president wrote a letter to the king of Saudi Arabia and said, you need to give $4 billion to us for reconstruction on the ground uh, in those parts of Syria where we've liberated uh, these areas from ISIS. The Saudis this week provided $100 million. The timing was probably not accidental, given everything that's going on, and I will touch on that a little bit later. Uh, but $100 million, as welcome as it is, given the areas that have been liberated, is not going to do a whole lot to meet what are the reconstruction needs. So when it comes to reconstruction, security, inclusion, and governance, which if you do all four of those things, then you fill the vacuum. I mean, bear in mind, one of the things we're facing in the region, one of the reasons ISIS emerged, both in Iraq and in Syria, uh, one of the reasons it emerged is because basically a vacuum was left. Nature abhors a vacuum, and in the Middle East, wherever there's a vacuum, the worst forces always fill it. And we've seen that in Syria, and we saw it for a while in Iraq as well. So if there's going to be a strategy for countering ISIS, it also has to have this it has to include something that embodies everything I just described in terms of governance, reconstruction, security, and the like. That's one side of the equation. There's another one. If you're really going to def defeat ISIS, you have to defeat ISIS by being able to discredit the ideology of ISIS. ISIS is basically a Salafi Muslim group. What Salafi means, it means it takes you back in time. They believe in the first four successors, the first four uh, caliphs after the prophet. And they want, to they want to return Islam to the day of the first four caliphs. Uh, and that's how you produce justice. Uh, now, if you're going to defeat them, you have to discredit that. Do you think that we can discredit it? Is it possible for any Western country to discredit this? It's a rhetorical question. No. So it has to be done from within the region. Now, ironically, one of the areas that Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, was doing something that was very important for the future of the Middle East, I would say for the future of Saudi Arabia. He was, in fact, not just trying to modernize Saudi Arabia. Was it something I said? No. Um, he was. He was trying not only to modernize Saudi Arabia, 
but he was explicitly taking on the religious clerical establishment in Saudi Arabia uh, in a way where he appointed as head of the World Muslim League someone who is uh, a religious scholar who has basically spent his career taking on the religious extremists. Uh, this actually is something that's important to be done because if it isn't done, you're not dealing with the source of ISIS's power. The real attraction of ISIS is not just that it had military success, although that was a critical element of it. The real attraction was that ISIS was feeling a kind of ideological vacuum. So there has to be an element of that as well that can't come from us, but any strategy has to be able to mobilize others who are part of, or share, I'll put it that way, share the same objective that we have. And that objective should be to discredit delegitimize that ideology. All right, so when I sum up how we are approaching the issue of ISIS, I would say we have a military approach, a military policy. We don't have an effective policy for ensuring that the vacuum gets filled by the right kind of forces. If the vacuum doesn't get filled by the right kind of forces, and we see Iran and the Shia militias trying to take more areas in the region, they have practiced wherever they've taken control an exclusionary approach to politics, which is what, and governance, is what helped to produce ISIS in the first place. So if we don't do that, we're going to see son of ISIS. Uh, if we don't, if we can't get others to discredit the ideology, for sure you're going to see son of ISIS. So I would say when it comes to the counter ISIS part of the Trump administration approach, there is much that needs to be done, but the areas I described are areas where you could do it if the administration recognizes that, and then begins to build a policy reflecting that. All right, so that's number one. How about the counter-Iranian strategy or policy? For sure, as I said, there is one. I should preface this discussion by saying what guides the administration's approach on Iran, and I would also say on the Palestinians, is maximum pressure. You've heard that term, maximum pressure? The president deeply believes it. You know, he believes that maximum pressure has worked on North Korea. And he holds that up as a model that can be applied to others. To be fair to him, and I'm very fair, to be fair to him, you would have to say that maximum pressure uh, was effective, at least in terms of ensuring that others would join with us, uh, to isolate the North Koreans, to apply much more severe kinds of uh, of sanctions, uh, and it's true in the first year of the administration, probably partly because of a fear that we might go to war, others, including the Russians and the Chinese, did much more than was the case before to put real meaningful pressure, economic pressure on North Korea. And what has happened is that after the, the summit, um, actually in anticipation of the summit, one of the things that that we've seen achieved, and it's fair to say this is an achievement, that there has been no more testing of intercontinental ballistic missiles, and there's been no more testing of nuclear warheads. Uh, and, you know, any administration that had come in would have sought that as a near-term intermediate objective. By the way, when President Obama met with, with then-President-elect Trump, he told him his number one threat internationally was North Korea. So the, the, base, the suspension of ICBM testing, the suspension of nuclear warheads, is a success. And it puts us in a better place than we would be. And it certainly, I think, was a function of the maximum pressure, but also that Kim Jong-un wants to modernize his country. Now, does that mean that the policy has succeeded? Has the policy achieved denuclearization? No. Is the policy going to achieve denuclearization? Maybe. I'm not confident it's going to achieve complete denuclearization. Uh, there's, a conceptually, there's a conceptual gap between the Trump administration uh, and Kim Jong-un's regime. The Trump administration says denuclearization before we relax any of the sanctions. The problem is that the rest of the world isn't going to join us with that. 
What North Korea seems to want is what they call a kind of integrated step-by-step -step approach. They take a step, they get sanctions eased over time. And I suspect if you look at where South Korea is right now, where you look at what China and Russia are doing right now, things are probably going to gravitate in that direction. One of the things that the administration wants as a, as a next step is a complete inventory of where all the labs are, where all the test sites are, where all the nuclear weapons are. And I would suggest to you that when they get that inventory, it'll make the Bashar al-Assad list revealing his chemical weapon sites in 2015, it'll make that list look like it was forthcoming. So I wouldn't hold my breath that we're going to see a great advance anytime soon, but I would still say we're in a better place than we were. And the president, unlike what I just said, the president believes he succeeded. He's, he's got the suspension. He gets, as in his words, lovely letters from Kim Jong-un. So he believes he succeeded. And he applies that model of maximum pressure to Iran. So we pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, which was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, the problem is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was negotiated by the permanent five members of the Security Council of the UN plus Germany. And they agreed to it along with the Iranians. And one party has pulled out. That would be us. Now, maximum pressure works when it's everybody. When there is a collective agreement that you're going to impose all these sanctions, when there's a collective agreement that Iran is truly going to be isolated, when we're the only one that pulls out, it's hard to produce maximum pressure. But I don't want to. You know, I don't want to leave you with a false impression. Iran is under pressure right now. I mean, it doesn't matter that the others haven't pulled out. It doesn't matter that the European Union actually adopted regulations that threatens to impose a fine on any European company that pulls out of Iran. Did you know that? Now you do. Will they really fine their companies if they pull out of Iran? I doubt it. I like to say capital is a coward. All the major multinational corporations that were uh, beginning to invest in Iran have pulled out. Why? Because the American sanctions that are imposed, especially those that will be imposed on November 4th, basically say if you do business with the Iranian Central Bank, you cannot do business with the American Central Bank, meaning you cannot do business in the United States. Now, if the choice is between doing business with Iran or doing business with the United States, guess who they choose? So starting on November 4th, the first set of sanctions that were imposed uh, will feed into what is the second set, and the second set really get at the heart of Iran being able to sell its oil. So Iran is going to be under increasing pressure, uh, even though the European governments don't want it to be under increasing pressure, because the European governments do not want the Iranians to pull out and withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. They worry if it does, we're going to be on a pathway to, to a war. So they're trying to create a set of incentives. They're, they're actually created a separate financing channel in which to do business with the Iranians. The problem is the only ones who will use that are those who are not exposed to the American market. So by definition, they're much smaller banks. They're much smaller kinds of, of corporations and firms. They don't bring the kind of capital that the Iranians themselves would really be interested in. Uh, and Iran will feel increasing pressure because of that. Now, the Iranian economy, even today, even before the second set of sanctions, the real sanctions kick in, is in very bad shape. But it's in bad shape because of them, because of corruption, because of mismanagement. About 40% of the Iranian economy is controlled by the Revolutionary Guard and the religious trusts in Iran. There is deep frustration in Iran. We have seen demonstrations since last December, and they have been ongoing since last December. At this point, my guess is that the Iranians will decide that they can hold on and see if they can outlast Trump. They will 
find that in a world where the only one who pulled out, the only one who agrees that we should have walked away from this was the US, we will find that others are not vigilant in terms of trying to plug holes in the sanctions regime. The Iranians on ships, they turn off the transponders, they will surreptitiously put oil on certain vessels, they will leak oil through Iraq, probably through some to Afghanistan. They'll do a lot of things to try to take advantage of the fact that the rest of the world is not committed to imposing the sanctions on them, so there won't be vigilance in terms of implementing the sanctions. Still, having said all that, my guess is, and the projections are, that Iran will be selling much less oil than it does now. Uh, my guess is that they, right now, they export 2.4 million barrels a day. I think that'll be down to less than a million. So even if the price of oil goes up, as it is likely to, because of squeezing the supplies, uh, they're going to be in a tougher position than they have been. This is at a time when their currency has been devalued by two-thirds, by two-thirds in the last several months. You know, to, to explain what that means, so if you had $1,000 in the bank, it's now worth one-third of that. There is a lot of angst and unhappiness within the Iranian public. Does that translate into putting an enormous amount of pressure on the regime? It could. Right now, I think the regime feels it can manage it. Right now, I think the regime feels uh, you know, it would rather have the US isolated than themselves. So they will stay in the deal, but my guess is they'll begin to cheat. But they'll cheat along the margins. And the other members of the 5 plus 1 who haven't walked away from the agreement or the deal will say, well, these are all marginal things. They'll explain them away because, again, they don't want the Iranians to walk away from it, number one. They will continue to see if they can get the Russians and the Chinese and the Europeans somehow to work around the American sanctions. And, and I think they will try to hold on and see if they can outlast Trump. As I said, the key will be, the key will be, do they find it difficult to manage the unhappiness within Iran? If the impact of the oil sanctions bites quite severely, if they find they're facing more and more difficulties, the pattern of the Iranians historically is to look for a way out when they're really under pressure. Just to give you a sense of that. You know, Khomeini, the original Ayatollah, the revolutionary one, uh, when they were fighting, when Iran was fighting Iraq, uh, he said they would fight that war forever, however long it took. When the price got very high, mostly because we were reflagging ships and actually we began to sink reflagging oil tankers that were going to Iraq and Kuwait, uh, we began then to sink uh, Iranian ships. The Iranians decided the price was too high and he ended the war. I said it was like taking, drinking poison from a chalice, but he ended the war. In the 1990s, they were assassinating dissidents in Europe. When the Europeans threatened sanctions over it, they stopped that. In 2003, when we defeated the Iraqi army in three weeks, oh, an army they couldn't defeat in eight and a half years, they thought they were next. And they put a series of proposals on the table. By the way, not only related to freezing their enrichment activities, they put on the table proposals that would have ended their military support for Hezbollah and Hamas. The problem was that the Bush administration at the time thought this indicated that they were on their last legs and they shouldn't rescue them. One of those moments that, unfortunately, the administration should have tested as opposed to not testing. In the Obama administration, I spent three years in the Obama administration, and I had responsibility on the Iran issue in those first three years, they said they would never negotiate with us as long as they were under sanctions. And we tripled down on the sanctions, guess what? They negotiated. You can debate how well we negotiated, but you can't debate the fact that when they said sanctions would make it impossible to negotiate, when the sanctions got worse, they negotiated. So what does that lead me to conclude? It leads me to conclude that sometime next year, if they feel really squeezed, they will look for a way out. But it won't mean negotiating directly with the Trump administration. 
That would be too much of an admission of defeat. My guess is they will go to the Russians. Putin loves being an arbiter. We're helping to ensure that he is an arbiter these days. Uh, and I think the Iranians will go with the proposal. And unquestionably, Putin will then raise it with Trump and try to broker between the two of us next year if the Iranians feel squeezed enough. If they don't, they'll wait to see if Trump is going to disappear, meaning if his, he'll have one term and he won't have a second term. So that makes it sound like, well, we do have a counter-Iranian policy, except that a major part of the policy is supposed to be countering, and I'm quoting now, malign Iranian activities in the region. Malign Iranian activities in the region. How many people think that we have an active policy to counter Iranian malign activities in the region, aside from saying that we have a policy to do that? It's also a rhetorical question. It's hard to find examples of it. I mean, yes, we are looking for sanctions, imposing sanctions, to be fair, including we're doing more to sanction Hezbollah. Um, but the Iranians are still able to get missiles, anti-ship missiles, to the Houthis in Yemen. There are two Security Council resolutions that exist that prohibit that, that they are violating. But I don't see a whole lot of evidence that we're, in, we're enforcing those, number one. Number two, in, in Syria, the Iranians are building what is a land bridge from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, to the Lebanese coast. We do nothing on that. We have basically turned it over to Israel. When it comes to countering Iran in Syria, it's Israel. Not us. Israel has carried out more than 200 missions against Iranian targets in Syria in the last 18 months. More than 200. You know, on May 10th, after the Iranians tried to fire rockets into Israel uh, from Syria, Israel hit 70 targets in one day. 70 Iranian Shia militia targets in one day. Israel is determined to prevent Iran from creating in Syria what it has created in Lebanon. There they have 130,000 rockets. There they have Hezbollah, which is basically controls what the government can do. And Israel is determined to prevent that. Iran is determined to create it. So it suggests a collision course. Now there's obviously another factor. There's the Russia factor. Now, a few weeks ago now, the Russians lost an IL-20 plane, 15, 15 members on 15 uh, military personnel on that plane were killed. It was shot down by uh, a Syrian surface-to-air missile. The Russians blamed the Israelis. They said when the Israelis carried out an attack, they, they used the, the Russian plane to mask their attack. Completely untrue. Someone, someone might actually call it fake news. Not me, but the Israelis sent a delegation the next day to Moscow that laid out uh, exactly where every plane was, where, when it was, where it moved, and so forth. The Israeli planes had been back in, Israeli, back in Israel for 24 minutes before the Syrians fired a barrage uh, of surface-to-air missiles against the Russian, that turned out to be against the Russian plane. But the Russians are in Syria to save Assad, not to accuse him. So they accused the Israelis. They didn't just accuse the Israelis. They announced their the defense minister announced that S-300s would be provided within two weeks, and they have been, at least the first elements of it, have been to the Syrians, which is, S-300 is a, a long-range surface-to-air missile. And the Russians also, the defense minister Shogun also announced that the Russians would now be imposing a new set uh, of operations themselves, 
increasing all sorts of electric countermeasures to make it more difficult to carry out attacks into Syria from the air. Now, I said before, Israel is determined to prevent the Iranians from creating in Syria what they have in Lebanon. When I say they're determined to do that, there's a reason for it. The Israelis don't care that the Iranians have a presence in Syria. What they care about is providing surface-to-surface -surface missiles, advanced guidance systems for those missiles that would put Israel in an extremely vulnerable situation. Israel is a small country. Because it's a small country, it has a small number of highly valued strategic targets. When I say that, that doesn't mean it's only military targets. It means economic targets. There are 130,000 rockets at Hezbollah has. If they're able to begin to put advanced guidance systems on them, and by the way, the Iranians just provided uh, global positioning systems there for that purpose, then Israel becomes very vulnerable. Israel won't wait for that to happen. Now, it's not just that there's a potential collision course between Israel and the Iranians. It's that the Russians are a factor here. What the Russians have effectively done is announce that they're going to limit Israel's freedom of action, which they've had up until now. But if Israel sees what is a strategic threat coming, it's going to act anyway. Are you surprised that I haven't mentioned the United States at all as I go through this? Well, you should be. But there's a reason I haven't mentioned it. Because we haven't done anything. Historically, the relationship to the United States and Israel as it related to threats followed the following formula. Israel basically said, we fight our own battles. You give us material, but we fight our own battles. But we fight our own battles against those in the region. When it comes to extra-regional threats, that's up to the United States. But that's not what's happening right now. What's happening right now is Israel deals with Iran on its own and the Shia proxies on its own in Syria, and Israel has to manage the Russians as well. Now, there is an answer for this. You know, when Prime Minister Netanyahu saw President Trump in New York uh, after the meeting, Prime Minister said he got everything he asked for as it related to the Russians. The President came out and said, yeah, I'm going to call Putin at some point. Well, that will impress him. What we should be saying, particularly if we don't want this to blow up, the problem with an Israeli-Iranian war that starts uh, in Syria is you know how it starts, you just don't know how it ends. And the problem with the Russians, in a sense, potentially limiting Israeli freedom of action is that Sooner or later, the Israelis will have to test that, too. In the near term, what it'll mean is that the Israelis won't hit any target that's close to the Russians, so that no Russians get killed. But this is, this is a problem waiting to happen. Unless we go to the Russians, meaning you go to Putin, and you basically say to Putin, if you're the president or you're Pompeo, you say, look, you would like the US. We have a, we have a presence of about 2,200 uh, military personnel in Syria today. There's a small number in the southern part of the country. The majority of them are in the northeast part of the country, just to the east of the Euphrates River. The Russians would like us out because it's, it's a complete symbol of their win and a symbol that, in a sense, the U.S. Is, is not relevant. But the Russians, you know, they may or may not do anything about it. My guess is they'd like us out. They'd like to put more pressure on us to get out. But if we were to go to them and say, you would like us out of Syria, first of all, you need to understand we're not going to get out of Syria, at least until there is a credible political process, and there isn't one today. But it's not the issue of us getting out. The issue is right now you're playing with fire. You want us out. If you limit Israel's freedom of action, you're going to end up sucking us in. We don't want to be there. Look, it's clear. Trump doesn't want to be there. We don't want to be there, but you know what? You run the risk of sucking us in. You, know, you will increase the prospect of a US-Russian confrontation there. So unless you do more to limit the Iranians, and here what I mean is 
I'm not saying the Iranians can't be there. What I'm saying is they can't be bringing surface-to-surface -surface missiles into Syria. They can't be providing advanced guidance systems for those missiles either in Syria or Lebanon. They can't be creating a set or a string of military bases that allows them to engage in more power projection from Syria. You could work out a set of thresholds or red lines that the Iranians wouldn't exceed. The Russians could put pressure on the Iranians along those lines. And you could broker a way to minimize, A, the prospect of a collision between Israel and the Iranians, and B, the prospect of somehow an Israeli escalation with the Russians, which is ultimately in nobody's interest. But it requires us to be very clear with Putin, here are the risks you're running, and then to act in a way that suggests these aren't just words. If we're going to affect what I just described, the administration has to do that. At this point, there's no sign that it is doing it, but it could. I hope it will. All right. So I've gone through ISIS. I've gone through Iran. How about the ultimate deal? So what do you think the prospects are of the ultimate deal? That's yes. Somebody went like this, and I said, quantitatively speaking, that's probably close to what I had in mind. Um, let's take a step back. First, I would say, would I like to see the ultimate deal? You bet. I spent 30 years working on this issue. Absolutely, I'd like to see it. Do I think the context, circumstances are ripe for it? No, because the level of distrust and really disbelief between the two sides has never been higher. It isn't to say there aren't things that could be done. There are things that could be done, but you start by trying to get each side to take a step to signal that, in fact, what the other side believes about them isn't the case. In the case of the Israelis, they're absolutely convinced that the Palestinians will never accept Israel as a state of the Jewish people. And the proof of that is, in Israeli eyes, is quite extensive. One sign of it is that they constantly reject the idea that Israel is a Jewish state. A second sign of it is, which affects most Israelis, they continue to provide uh, much higher, let me put it this way, if you are a Palestinian who is serving a sentence in an Israeli jail because you tried to carry out an act of terror or violence against Israelis, the worse the offense, the more your family gets paid by the Palestinian Authority. So most Israelis view that as pay for slay. Doesn't look like you're committed to a peaceful arrangement. Uh, on the Palestinian side, they perceive there is no way the Israelis will ever accept an independent Palestinian state. And the proof for them is Israel keeps building in the midst of what would be a Palestinian state. So each of them can point to behaviors by the other that confirms their view that the other's not interested. If you really wanted to begin to change the circumstances, you'd start there. You'd get the Israelis to stop building outside the settlement blocks. Basically, the settlement blocks take up about 5% of the West Bank, leaving plenty of room for a state. And you'd declare that there won't be any Israeli sovereignty to the east of where the security barrier is today, which is on about 8%. You get the Palestinians to still provide material support to the families of those who are in jail because they don't have breadwinners, but you stop giving them priority. You stop giving them more pay for the longer that their, their relatives are in jail, and you treat them like anybody else who gets welfare. They actually have a Department of Welfare in the Palestinian Authority. There should be, they should be put in the same category as everybody else. They shouldn't be given priority. They shouldn't be given more. If that were to happen, you would change the psychology. It's not, a, it's not going to transform everything overnight because the disbelief is deeply rooted right now. But that would be a starting point. Now, there's a second thing you would do. You do have to find a way to bring the Arabs into this. When you look at the Trump administration when they came in, they, had a, they began to talk about something called outside-in. What outside-in referred to was because of the convergence of strategic interests between the Sunni Arab leaderships and Israel when it came to Iran, 
And to some extent, when it came to ISIS, increasingly the Sunni Arab leaders looked at Israel and thought, gee, you know what? We may not be able to trust the Americans. The Russians are the problem. The Chinese are mercantilists. The Europeans are from Venus, not Mars. But the Israelis, you know, they don't just talk about things. They actually do it. So there's a strategic convergence below the radar screen, a lot of very practical, tangible cooperation in security areas. And the idea was, look, you've got this convergence. Let's use that for peace. It's not a concept that was wrong. It's just that the emphasis in it and the sense of what the Arabs would do was wrong. The idea of outside in was that the Arabs will take the place of the Palestinians. They'll agree for them. That was never going to happen. It isn't to say that there isn't a role for the Arabs. And to be fair to the administration, now at least the people working on it, they have evolved. They now know the Arabs won't play that role. The question is, what role can they play? Now, obviously, this is the point where I digress and I talk about the Saudis and Khashoggi. There was, the administration had placed a very high priority on the role that the Saudis would play. Even as they lower their expectations, they can't deliver the Palestinians, but they could still play a role in terms of emphasizing the credibility uh, of, the, of the plan that will be presented. Uh, when Mohammed bin Salman came to the United States last March, uh, he met Jewish groups, he talked about how in private, he talked about how this was not a priority for most Saudis. Uh, he gave an interview to Jeff Goldberg where he used language that no other Arab leader has ever used. He was asked the question, do the Jews have the right to a state in what has been their homeland? And his answer was yes. No Arab leader had ever said that before. He said the Jews have a right to a state. The Jews, not Israel, because the Palestinians like to say the Jews are not a people. That's why they don't, when they want to deny the issue of Israel as a state of the Jewish people, they say the Jews are not a people, it's a religion. Here was the crown prince of Saudi Arabia saying, no, I acknowledge that they're a people and they have a right to a state. He said, just as the Palestinians are a people and have a right to a state. Now his father reeled him in after that, meaning they put out much more traditional kind of formulations after that. They actually, they actually hosted an Arab summit. We are likely to see the crown prince being reeled back. I say reeled back. I don't say, I don't see him removed. I don't see a great upheaval in the royal family, uh, but I do see maybe some checks on his power. He has been put in a position that no other Saudi leader has ever been put in before, or he has acquired uh, through his own means, the ability because his father has backed him. He holds every instrumentality of power in the kingdom today. That's why it becomes hard to believe that he didn't know about what happened to Khashoggi. Now, they have put out a story Friday night. They refined it yesterday with a, an official. The irony is the story that they're putting out now, had it been put out a couple days after what happened, it would have been much more plausible. It would have been far more credible. It's not, they're not saying there was a fistfight. What they're saying is there was a team of people sent there as part of a policy to bring dissidents back to Saudi Arabia, which has been their policy. Uh, this team went there to negotiate with him, not to kill him. Uh, this team you know, said, you have to leave and come with us. And he said, no. And I've, I've told the Turks that if they don't hear from me, I've told my fiance to call the Turkish officials if they don't hear from me within an hour. And that led to a shouting match. They tried to quiet him. Someone put him in a chokehold, and he died. They then said they rolled him up in a, a rug and then uh, gave that rug to somebody. No indication of, of the bone saws being used, no indication of the body being cut up, and so forth. And then the claim is that those who did it knew they weren't supposed to kill him, so they tried to cover up what they did. Uh, and all that could have been believable if it had been for a couple of days. But the fact that it went on for 17 days makes it harder to believe. Now, I'll say two things, three things about this. You know, I am one of those who have written about the significance of what MBS is doing within Saudi Arabia. 
from the standpoint of modernization, the fact that there's never been a successful model of development in the Arab world for larger Arab countries. And precisely because there's been no such successful model, because governance has been so bad, because corruption is so great, because power is in the hands of the few and wealth is in the hands of the few, you have this great alienation. And that alienation is what has contributed to the appeal of those like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and before them, people like Nasser. The absence of a successful model of modernization and development gives rise to the appeal of the extremes in the Middle East. What he was doing, if he could have succeeded at it, would be significant. Just as what, he would, what he's doing in terms of trying to undermine the ideology would be significant. Those are strategic interests of the United States. I would say even more than selling arms to them. But another strategic interest of the United States is that there should be global norms. You shouldn't be able to go and lure somebody into a consulate or an embassy and kill them. And if we can't get the Russians to stop that, we at least want to demonstrate, so they don't do it that way, they do it with poison, um, we ought to at least be able to demonstrate that there's a high price for engaging in that kind of behavior. And it's not accepted. So my own prescription would be we do two things. One, we should suspend arms sales to Saudi Arabia. And one of the reasons to suspend arms sales is because Mohammed bin Salman is also the defense minister. So you're doing this directly because what the defense minister, if he didn't know, you can even say that, if he didn't know, he should have known. And there has to be a price. The other thing is we should insist on creating a no surprises channel. One of the things that Mohammed bin Salman needs is a senior advisory group around him. And if he doesn't have that on the inside, although I suspect that may be one of the things that happens now, or at least could happen, if he doesn't have it on the inside, at least you should have it on the outside. By the way, it wouldn't be the worst thing for the administration to have that. A mutual no surprises channel. Now I raise all this with Mohammed bin Salman not only because it's obviously current, but it relates again to the issue of Arabs and the role the Arabs will play. I think what's happening with him right now in Saudi Arabia may make him less inclined to play this role on this issue. He doesn't need to be exposed in his eyes on an issue that's also controversial within the region. So it may reduce the impulse to do what I think is necessary. Why is it necessary? There is a need for Arab cover for the Palestinians because they can't make a decision, they can't make a concession on their own. You know, think, I want you to think about the following. The Palestinians have not accepted any peace proposal that we've made over the years. Uh, Arafat rejected the Clinton parameters. Had they accepted, they would have had a state. Not cantons, they would have had a viable independent state. He rejected it. In 2008, Omer offered Abu Mazen something that actually went beyond what we put in the Clinton parameters. He never got a response. March 17, 2014, President Obama presented a set of principles to Abu Mazen that went beyond what had been agreed to with Netanyahu. I know a fair amount about this because I was running a back channel on it. He never got a response. To this day, we never got a response. There have been opportunities for the Palestinians, but the idea of making concessions is too hard for them because they have created a narrative that they're the victim of injustice, that they are the weakest party, they are divided, and it should be up to the Israelis to make all the concessions. They need an Arab cover to be able to agree to something. It isn't the Arabs taking the place of the Palestinians and deciding for them. It's the Arabs helping to assume responsibility for the decisions that Palestinians would make that they can't make exclusively on their own. But the Israelis need that just as much as the Palestinians for a different reason. 90% of the, of the Israelis today no longer believe that any concession that would be made to Palestinians will produce anything from the Palestinians. So if they're going to make concessions to the Palestinians, which is the only way you can have a deal, they have to get something from the Arabs. There is a need for an Arab role. 
The administration is right on that. The critical question now is, can the Arabs play that role if MBS is playing less of a role? The answer is maybe. But what will it take? It will take a certain content in the peace plan that has been developed by the administration, by Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt. And it depends on a process of how they present it. If you're going to achieve anything from the Arabs, I will tell you, the maximum you can get from Arab leaders, and here I'm talking about the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, and Moroccans. They make up something called the Arab Quartet. They're larger than a quartet, but they still make up something called the Arab Quartet. The most you can get is that they will say they have questions about the plan, but it's a credible basis or a serious basis for negotiations. Now to get that, you have to have two things in the plan. One, this, you have to have a Palestinian state. No Arab leader is going to sign up to something and say, or not even sign up and say, this is serious if there isn't a Palestinian state. And no Arab leader is going to say it's serious if there isn't a capital for that state in some significant part of Arab East Jerusalem. They care less about the other items in it. These are what they would have to be able to point to. So this plan will have to have those two elements in it. And even then, it has to be presented in a certain way. Today, none of the Arab leaders have been shown the plan. They will not agree to something they haven't seen in black and white, the text. The text is going to have to be shown to them. And after and the smart way of doing this, smart statecraft way of doing this, would be to allow the Arabs to make a few changes in what's been presented to them. So they feel like they've had some imprint on it. I'm not suggesting go renegotiate it. The administration won't. But a few places let them make changes because, by the way, they know what is easier to defend in their circumstances. And even then, after you've done that, then you have to sit down and negotiate with them word for word what they will say in response when you publish this. Once you have that in hand, then you take that to the Europeans. Because the Europeans will not be more Arab than the Arabs. When you have European and Arab leaders both saying this is a serious basis for negotiations, the Palestinians cannot say no. The only thing the Palestinians feel, as a people, feel that they have achieved is international acceptance of their movement. They're not going to put that at risk if, in fact, you've lined up the Europeans and the Arabs. So the what and the how are very important. It suggests that, <coughs> it suggests that this plan may yet have a possibility. Now, instead of asking, do I think they're going to do it, I'll simply flag a couple of concerns I have. One, the pattern of the administration up to now has not been to present things and work them in private in advance. Uh, the smart way to have done the Jerusalem declaration by president was either make it part of the plan so the Palestinians are getting something too, or go in advance, a couple months in advance of making this decision to the key Arab leaders and say, look, you know President Trump, all the other presidents exercised the Jerusalem waiver. He's different, he won't. He made a promise, he'll live up to it. You respect people who make promises, but we don't want to surprise you. And we don't want to, we don't want to deny you your political space because we're counting on you to work with us. So let's work on how we're going to frame this publicly so it causes you the least amount of damage. But we didn't do that. Secondly, as part of the maximum pressure, we have completely cut off the Palestinians. Now, when we cut off the Palestinians, we made it that much harder for Arab leaders to say, yeah, we're prepared to respond to what you present. You can't adopt a position that never seems to take into account any Palestinian concerns and then expect the Arabs to turn around and say, yeah, we're open to you being serious. So some of the steps they should have taken in advance, they clearly haven't. Moreover, you take an issue like Gaza. The risk of Gaza blowing up is very high. There is less than four hours a day of electricity in Gaza. 96% of the water in Gaza is undrinkable. 
There isn't the power to fuel sewage treatment plants. Israel has actually had to turn off its desalinization plant in Ashkelon because the sewage from Gaza flows towards Israel. Israel has its own interest in this. But when life becomes really difficult, you don't have a whole lot to lose. And what did the administration do? It cut off UNRWA. Now, I will tell you, I was not against the principle of cutting off UNRWA. I think UNRWA perpetuates the refugee problem. It doesn't do anything to ameliorate it. But if you were going to cut off UNRWA, you had to understand UNRWA provides 13,000 jobs in Gaza. UNRWA provides funding for all the schools in Gaza. UNRWA provides an extensive food program where more than a million people in Gaza depend on the food. What the administration could have done is we're cutting under the same day they announced they're cutting it, they would have announced the $335 million were going into specific mechanisms for these kinds of programs in Gaza. Then the message would have been, okay, this isn't against the Palestinian people. But the way it was done made it look like it was against the Palestinians. But that's part of maximum pressure, right? Well, that may work with some people. The Palestinians have developed a narrative of resistance. When Arafat left Camp David, he goes back to Gaza and he went back as a great winner. He had defied the United States and Israel. Defiance is always the tool of the weak. And in the case of the Palestinians, defiance has defined who they are. So you play into what is that narrative as opposed to making it less likely. Now, it's not too late, but it's getting late. There needs to be a focus on preventing a blow up in Gaza. One of the ways that would happen is if, and by the way, uh, there is now a mechanism that has been created by, there's a UN peace process coordinator named Nikolai Mladenov, who has created a mechanism through the World Bank to fund these kinds of projects on the ground without going through Hamas and without going through now the Palestinian Authority. So if you allow those projects to begin to get implemented and people also get put back to work, Hamas has its own incentive not to block that. So doing that, improving the situation on the ground in Gaza, not only prevents a blow up, but it could allow, especially if the administration were to put some money into this, it could allow the administration to demonstrate that it actually does care about the Palestinian people. Not just by saying it, by doing some practical things. Prevent the blow up, try to work with both sides in advance on getting each of them to take a step that shows the perceptions of them by the other side are not right, uh, and then orchestrating the presentation, both in content and in process, uh, with the key Arab leaders the way I described, something could change for the better. So there, I outlined what the approach is on ISIS. I pointed out where it could be improved. I did the same on Iran, and I did the same on the ultimate deal. And as I said, I would like very much for there to be an ultimate deal someday. I just don't think it's coming that soon. I'll stop there and take questions.